Well, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, appreciate those that have uh, tuned in to watch these uh, messages. Uh, those that are not able to get out and go to church, I certainly do appreciate that. And, uh, and of course, I want to also say a thank you to Eddie and Molly Smith. Uh, they are the ones that have been providing the choruses and the hymns uh, that go along with these messages. And uh, if you want to see and listen to those songs, uh, you can go on YouTube and you would be able to find them there or on our website and just click on the link that takes you to YouTube uh, from the Open Bible website and you can see the uh, messages as well as the worship songs also. So before we begin, we take a look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Again, I want to remind you is that we are right now not being asked to lay aside our Christian walk and our faith in the Bible is not being violated by being asked to shelter in place or to do the social distancing. And as always, uh, you know, if we would be asked to do something contrary to God's word, well, at that point, then we need to take a stand. Uh, but as of right now, uh, this appears to be that it is for our uh, protection. And so we want to make sure that people have a clarity on there are times where we need as believers to say, no, that violates God's word and I'm not going to practice that. Uh, and then there are these times where we realize that everybody has to social distance. Everybody is sheltering. There isn't, you know, if we're not being singled out as uh, one group of people or another group of people being asked to do this, this is something that the entire nation has been asked to do. What I'd like to do before we get into 1 Peter is I want to share with you out of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is a wonderful book because it includes the destruction of Jerusalem and the Hebrew people being taken off into captivity by the Babylonians. And I say it's wonderful because there are going to be two incidences that you'll be very familiar with that they were asked to violate their faith. They were asked to lay aside their relationship with God or their faith in God to follow a pagan practice. And in both incidences, the answer was no, we're not going to do that. And so the first one that I want to share with you is out of Daniel chapter 3. Now, out of Daniel chapter 3, uh, we see here, this is the incident of the fiery furnace. You know, the king Nebuchadnezzar has made an idol. A statue. It is 90 feet high. It is nine feet wide. And he was so proud of this statue that he had people come in from all around the country to come in and see and observe and to look and eventually be asked to bow down and worship the statue. And so he brings all of the leaders, all of the governors uh, into the city of Babylon and he says, now when the music sounds, and if you go back and take the time to read it, there's going to be musicians, there's trumpets, and there's horns, and there's stringed instruments, and all kinds of different things. And there's going to be actually a symphony of music. He says, when you hear the symphony, when you hear the music, all nations, all people, all languages are to bow and to worship the idol. And whoever does not worship this idol will be thrown into the fiery furnace. And it says immediately thrown in. Well, obviously the music sounds and thousands of people that have gathered in the courtyards and around the area to see the statue bow down. And there are three lone men standing straight up and they're not bowing down. And so immediately they are taken and they are brought before the king. And the king even says, I'm going to give you a second chance. Now, this is violating his own decree. He says, I'm going to give you guys a second chance. So when you hear the music, if you'll bow down, then we'll let this incident go by. But if you don't, then I'm going to toss you into the furnace. Well, it's interesting because uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego they say in verse 16 of that third chapter, it says, we don't even have to think about it. The answer is no. We're not bowing down. Now, we are told then that 
Nebuchadnezzar becomes so angry that he increases the heat of the furnace seven times hotter than it normally would be. Because see, they make it clear in verse 18, he says, we do not serve your gods, nor are we going to worship your golden image. So in 19, we were told of the heat of the furnace, and Max was told that the men who threw them into the furnace because of the intensity of the heat, they were killed from the heat, how hot it was, tossing them into the furnace. Once they were thrown into the furnace, the governors and the king and the people around them are looking into the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar turns to one of the people next to him and says, now, did we not throw three people into the furnace? And the person responded and said, yes, O king, we, we only threw in three. And Nebuchadnezzar is, why do I see four? And of course, we all know that the fourth man in the furnace was the Lord. And this is a wonderful reminder to you and I. You know, as a Christian, we all go through battles and storms. As a matter of fact, that's just life for everybody. But I, what I like about this is that there are some times that God is so gracious to us and he will deliver us from our problems and some of our battles and storms. But you know, sometimes he lets us go into the furnace so that he can prove himself to us. He shows himself to us mighty. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and those people that were with King Nebuchadnezzar, they got to see the fourth man. They got to see the fourth man in the furnace with them. And believer, I want you to know, no matter what goes on, you know that the Lord is with you always, just like he was with them. And so he calls them out. And in doing so, it says that their clothes didn't even smell like fire. The flames actually burned off the ropes that had bound them. And then they come out and they are totally fine. And Nebuchadnezzar is so shocked by this that he says in verse 29, he goes, there is no other God that can deliver like this God. And then we are also told then in verse 30 that all three were promoted and the Lord had blessed them for their obedience. Well, obviously then the next one would be found in Daniel chapter 6. Again, very familiar. The Babylonians no longer are in charge of the area of Babylon. It has now been taken over by Darius, a Persian. And Daniel is serving him. Now, Daniel had a habit of going to his apartment, his room, his home, and praying three times a day. And in doing so, he would always open up the doors and look up to heaven, and he would pray. Again, I encourage you to go back and read the sixth chapter of Daniel in there. And what this did is it offended the governors and the people around him. They didn't like it. You know, you don't believe the way that I believe. And unfortunately, you know, we have people that still think that way today. You know, you don't believe what I believe. And, uh, but all of it is to say that they didn't, uh, they, they decided to do, and they didn't like Daniel. They didn't like what he was doing, didn't like what he stood for. Because in verse three, it says that he distinguished himself above the other. So they had a little bit of jealousy going on here. And they want to get rid of him. And if you go back and read it, it'll say that, that they could not find any fault in his work. There was something, he'd, there, there was nothing that they could point a, a finger at and say this disqualifies him from being in leadership because he did everything that he was supposed to do and even above the others. In verse five of that chapter, it says, you know, we cannot find a fault unless it's against him concerning his God. And so they came together, they consulted with each other, then they go to the king. Oh, king, we got a great idea. Let's do this. Let's make, let's make a decree. You sign a decree that for the next 30 days that nobody, nobody 
praise to any God or to any man except to you, O king. And Darius signs it thinking it was a great idea. And of course, later on, he'll find out he was entrapped. And we'll share what that happens in just a moment. But Daniel did not change his practice. He didn't change his practice for fear of that. And I suppose he could have. He could have kept the doors closed and prayed anyway. But he chose not to. He chose not to, he don't, not to back away from what the decree was. He says, I am going to serve my God. And I'm going to pray to my God. And I'm going to open up the doors or the windows. And you know what? I'm going to do what I've always done. And of course, these men that did this to him knew that's what he was going to do. They were counting on it, planning on it, hoping that he would do that. Well, of course, Daniel did. So we're told in verse 10 that he had opened up the window, knelt down, and prayed to God as was his custom. And they knew that was his custom. Well, obviously, it gets reported back to the king. And because he had signed the decree saying that if somebody didn't do it, they had to be tossed into the lion's den. And it could not be revoked. You've heard of the laws of the Medes and Persians, irrevocable. Well, that's one of them. And since he signed it, he had to do it. Well, we're told that he was up all night. The king had tremendous respect for Daniel. I mean, this bothered the king. And so they had to take Daniel. They put him into the lion's den. They sealed it up, it says. And then you go back and read it. It says that the king did not eat, drink, or sleep that night until he waited for the morning. And then at dawn, he runs out to where Daniel had been placed and says, Oh, Daniel, Daniel, has your God delivered you? And then Daniel's response in verse 22 is, God sent an angel to shut the mouth of the lion. Again, if our faith is challenged and we're being asked to do something that is not in line with the word of God, God would honor that stand. Interestingly though, in verse 24, all of the ones who plotted against Daniel, all of them were taken and thrown into the lion's den than themselves. And it came back upon them. What they thought they were going to do to Daniel was actually done to them. And let me give you one more example. And it's out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. And again, I encourage you to look that up. But even Jesus was asked by those who did not like him, that were against him, concerning paying taxes or paying tithes. Now, if, if you are someone that's not familiar with being in church, a tithe would be our offering. In other words, a 10% of our income that we take and set aside and we give to the church that we attend. And so that is a tithe. And so what they were doing is they were trying to create a political question to trap Jesus, trying to make him to, you know, commit making a statement saying, well, you know, if he says only pay tithes to the church, then we can say, well, then you're against Rome. And if he says, well, pay your taxes, then they'd say, oh, so you're in favor of Rome and you're against the church. So in their thinking, it was a no-win question. But of course, Jesus being God uh, had an answer that they baffled him. It just says the word, it astounded them. So, so what do we do, Jesus? Do we pay taxes or do we pay our tithes? And Jesus, like what we do today, says you do both. Give or render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay your taxes. If your taxes are due, then you pay your taxes. And give to God the things that are God. And it says at the end of that 17th verse, they marveled at him. They did not have an answer. Well, I have no doubt as we get closer to the return of Christ and we keep seeing markers and things for the last days and which actually our next time together, well, I'm going to touch on some of the last day things that we're seeing going on around the world. We will at some point as Christians take a stand and say, nope, this violates my principles as a Christian. This violates God's word. And then at that point, um, 
then you got to decide how you're going to walk with the Lord. But back in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want to just read verse 11, then we'll jump up to some other verses here. But I like verse 11 because it says this. Peter is writing and he says, Now, beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. And a little 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that they may speak again, that they may speak again, not speak against you as evildoers, that they may be your good works and would observe your good works, which they observe and glorify God in his that day of visitation. So two things about those verses really quick. Number one, it is a reminder to us as Christians is that we are sojourners. A sojourner is a pilgrim. Basically, it means this. This is not our home. Our home is in heaven with Christ. This is, we're just passing through. As I tell the people in my church, we're temps. We're all temps. We're all here temporarily. At some point, uh, we will pass away and either go home and be with the Lord. Or if you do not have Christ, uh, obviously the punishment then uh, is, is hell. And that's just how the word is. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of John chapter 3, Remember, I think I told you this before when we did last time, you know, Gospel of John chapter 3, uh, and 3 says, you know, you got to be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. And if you're not born again, you're not even going to see it. And born again simply meant, as I shared with you last week, a 180 degree turn. That is a change that takes place in us, uh, you know, as people and as we grow in Christ and as Christians, and the things we used to do, we don't do anymore. So that brings us now to verse 13. He says, Now therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance, institution, law of man, for the Lord's sake, rather to the king supreme. Um, interesting. It is for the Lord's sake. It is a witness. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down. It was a witness. And Nebuchadnezzar proclaimed that there is no God like this God. And the same with Daniel. You know, the king, Darius, runs out and says, did your God deliver you, Daniel? And he says, oh, yeah, send an angel, shut the mouths of the lions. And so this is about being a witness for Christ, that we are willing to uh, take and lay aside our personal rights, which our personal rights are, and we see people fighting for them. You know, I want to meet, I want to go out, I want to do this, and I want to do that. That's a personal right. And for temporarily, we're being asked to lay aside a personal right. But it is also a witness to those around us as Christians and that we are setting an example uh, in this obedience and this time of listening to what the government is telling us. In verse 14, it says, Or to the governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. And again, the governors and the authorities over us they should be busy, supposed to be busy taking care of those that are working evil. Those that, you know, are, are the, 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 the robbers, the murderers, the rapists, uh, you know, those things. He says those people are evil and their job is to contain them. And that's what they're that's what they do. But he says, you know what, if you're not in that category and you're obeying the government, and you're doing what you're supposed to do. He says that is a praise. Now, I told you at the beginning of this last time in the first one, I am not interested in getting praised by the government. That's not something that I, I care about. But I do care about being a witness to the people around me. And that's what I want to do. In verse 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You see, he says, if you're showing the right example, then people who do not understand Christianity people who are against Christianity, people who think that all the world's problems are because of the Christians, uh, you know, all of this stuff. He says, you know what? That's foolish and that's ignorant talking. If you are obeying God's word and you're doing what you're supposed to do, and like right now, sheltering, because that's what we're asked to do, and distancing, because that's what we're asked to do. He says, if you're doing those things, he says, that'll put silence to these ignorant people. And people are ignorant because they don't know the word of God. Before I became a Christian, I never read the Bible. 
Never read it. But when I became a Christian, one of the first things that God gave me was a hunger to understand his word and to read it so I could fully understand what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, what God does in my, in my relationship with him and why he does the things that he does. You know, I can read the word of God and now I have an understanding. I see why things are the way they are and how God has established those things. Now, Paul tells us in Corinthians that the things that we do is foolishness to the world. And that is true. You know, people look at Christians and they're like, why do you guys do what you do? You know, that's stupid. And before I was saved, honestly, I thought the same thing. I thought, why, do you, why did Christians do that? And, uh, uh, you know, when you become a Christian, you start reading God's word, you go, oh, okay, I understand. That's why God would have us do whatever it may be. And so in that, he says, you, you put to silence that ignorance. And in verse 16, it says this. Now, as free, and what he means by free, and now Paul takes the time, uh, especially in the book of Corinthians, and in those days, what they would do is they would take meat and offer it up to a pagan sacrifice, maybe the goddess of Diana, Asher, uh, you know, Olympus, wherever it is, they would offer that meat up, and that would be the burnt offering for the person that had given it. And then what they would do then is they would take that meat and they would sell it in a store. And so there was a division between some of the people who said, well, you know, if it's a meat that's been offered up to idols, don't you should be eating it. And then other groups said, well, no, you know, the idol doesn't mean anything. Paul's perspective was this. He said, I serve the true living God. If something has been offered up to an idol, that is meaningless to me because that idol is absolutely nothing. It is a piece of wood, a piece of metal, a statue. It is meaningless to me, it has no power. So if I'm eating meat that had been offered to that idol, he goes, that does not bother me, that doesn't convict me. But then what he does in that chapter, he goes, but you know, if I know that it is going to be a stumbling block for a brother or a sister in Christ, that if they saw me doing that, and that would hurt their walk with God in some way, I am willingly going to lay aside that right, that freedom, to eat that meat that had been offered to an idol. I'm going to lay that aside as a witness for them, not because it bothers me, Paul said. And so that's what he means here. So we have these freedoms, but he says, you know what? Don't abuse it. Don't abuse it. Could he have eaten the meat? Sure he could have. But he chose not to because he wanted his witness to speak to those either that were weak Christians that needed strengthen and or his witness for the Lord to those that don't know Christ, but they might help draw them in to a relationship with the Lord. And then he goes on here, he says in 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So as we close out this time together, as always, I want to end with a word of prayer. And I want those who are listening to this as Christians to, again, be reminded that um, right now, right now, not that it can't change next week or next month or next year, but as right now, uh, we're being asked to obey the authorities over us. And as Christians, we can do that as an example to those around us. And next week, I will uh, talk about the last days. I will talk a little bit about... Uh, some of the things that we see going on and how things can lead to uh, fulfillment of the prophecies uh, in the Bible, but obviously that'll be next week. So thank you. Thank you for watching this. Uh, God bless you, and uh, we'll close in a word of prayer. And uh, as always, I want to uh, ensure that you have an opportunity, if you're watching this, that you don't know Christ as Savior, uh, that you would take this time to do that and ask him into your life and forgive you of your sins. And who knows, maybe you're watching this and you've gotten away from the Lord, and uh, it's time to come back, time to come back into that relationship with him. So with those things said, let's pray. Father, we come to you, and we just ask Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, number one, that you would surround us with protection, with angels, and giving us godly wisdom as we walk through uncertain times. And we know, Lord, that no matter what, that we are not going to bow down to a statue. We're not going to bow down to a king. Uh, we just bow down to you, because you are the king of kings. So I pray, Lord God, as we walk through this, give 
the Christians. Give us wisdom and give us courage as we see these things taking place and realizing, Father, that for now, the government that is over us is not just asking Christians to shelter uh, and to keep a distance, but everyone is doing this. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would give all people wisdom from the leaders of this nation and state all the way down to leaders and churches and just individual believers as well. And I pray, Lord God, you know what? Maybe somebody is listening to this and they've never asked Christ in their life. Maybe they've been a Christian, but they've strayed away. And I pray right now, Lord, that you would just prick their heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, if you would just pray, it's just so, the sinner's prayer is so simple. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Wash me with the blood of Jesus Christ that had been shed. And Lord, give me the strength that I need to walk with you on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, uh, thank God, you know, part of the kingdom of God and finding yourself in a church uh, that teaches God's word, that they don't water it down. Uh, they teach God's word and that you can grow in Christ. So I want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to me, uh, Babylon, I guess, and uh, share some thoughts uh, and just joking around. Anyway, sharing some thoughts with you. Uh, may God bless you. And uh, we will see you next week. Thank you so much for your time. God bless you.